this morning, I do want to remind you of the um, Bible study this evening at 5 o'clock downstairs or by um, Zoom. Um, that was very interesting last week, doing it by Zoom in the meeting and, and all of that. And for the first time, I had a video I put up and had going back and forth. And I look very tech savvy. <laughs> So if you want to see my tech savviness, um, you'll be here tonight at 5. We'll continue. We're on the, um, the second week. We still have some of the booklets back there. If you'd like to pick up and get involved, you're not too late. We take you at any point. That'll be at 5 this evening. The Jesus you may not know. You know, the scriptures are full of truth about Jesus. And as we delve into the scriptures, we, we see him more clearly and he just comes alive. And it's very important that we understand who Jesus is. Because it's through him and by him that we're saved. It's by what he did at the cross for us, through his resurrection and the fact that right now he's, he's interceding for us and he's always with us. We need to know who he is, we need to know more about him, but we also need to understand who we are in him. So this series of Jesus you may not know, we're going to cover many topics, and this week we're going to look at, is he from the Old Testament or the New Testament? Now, when you read the Old Testament, and I'm not talking about numbers and some of them were just like, and he beget so-and-so, and so-and-so beget so-and-so, and they had 1,800 children, and then their children show them. Some of that, I understand, it, it gets, okay. Some, some, I've had people ask me, Pastor, if I'm going to read the Bible through, do I have to read those books? <laughs> well, you can't skip chapter 2 in a book and say you've read the whole book. Okay? You do read that. And there's things that are hidden in there at times that we don't always see. But many people think that the Old Testament God is very different than the New Testament God. There are actually people who say, you know what, we're not Jews, and since the Old Testament was basically the prophets and stuff for the Jews, and we just ignore that, we'll look in the New Testament and we'll find Jesus. And we'll just read the New Testament. Here's what I want you to understand. That as you read the Old Testament, it's Jesus. They were pastor, I don't know about that. We're going to look at some things today. But as you look in the Old Testament, it is Jesus concealed. The New Testament is Jesus revealed. We can better understand the New Testament when we delve into the Old Testament. There was a time that I, I was like, you know what? The Old Testament's got a lot of great stories. Man, good stories. And as some of you probably when your children were growing up, you had a picture of Noah's Ark hanging on the wall. And it was one of these boat-shaped things. You had animals sticking their heads out all of the windows. And there's Noah up there. I'm oh, just all proud. I got my boat. It wasn't anything like that. But there's a point and an understanding of the story of the ark that goes beyond just saving the animals and people. Who is our ark of safety? It's Jesus. Who shut the door when they went in the ark? God did. Who shuts us in him when we come to know Jesus? God does. He says, I'll hold you in my hand. It's all about Jesus. It's not just a cute story. So today we want to look at, is he from the Old Testament or the New, Te the New Testament? And Jesus explained to his followers while he was here on earth that the Old Testament was actually about him. He told us his disciples, it's, it's about me. It's, a, it's all about Jesus. And when Jesus was alive on earth, that's what he said. This, this scripture I found this week, I've read it many a times, and I don't know if it's ever jumped off the pages like it did this week. It's in John chapter 5, 37 through 40. And the Father himself who sent me, and me is Jesus there, has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. But you do not have his word abiding in you because whom he sent, him you do not believe. You search the scriptures. Now, who is it that's saying this in John 5? Jesus is. 
He says, you search the scriptures. What were the only scriptures they would have had at that time? The writings of Moses and the prophets. The Old Testament. That's all they would have had. Did you search the scriptures? For in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. Jesus said, you search the scriptures, you think you find life in those. But they testify of me. The Old Testament is all about Jesus. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. Jesus himself told us the Old Testament scriptures, the writings of the prophets, the writings of Moses are all about him. I want to pause you. Let's just think for a second. If you look back to the Old Testament, the story of Jonah, it's all about Jesus. How he was swallowed by the big fish and for three days he was there. Then he was spit up. It's all about him. The other stories, like I said, Noah and the ark, it's all about Jesus. The stories of Abraham are all about Jesus. It's Jesus concealed in the New Testament, Jesus revealed. See, Jesus instead of, said, in effect, God the Father spoke endlessly about me in the writings of the Old Testament. You find everything about me there because these scriptures testify of me. They prove my identity. And yet you still will not come to me. See, the Jews did not accept Jesus as their Messiah, and they still don't today. They missed it, and they're missing it. But in the Old Testament is the footprint of the Messiah that has already come, and we have accepted as our Savior. Today in this message, I want to look at, at four, four different things really quick. I want to cover three from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament, where we see that it, the scriptures are all about Jesus. As you read through the Old Testament, I want it to come alive to you. Jesus, is he from the Old Testament? Is he from the New? So to illustrate that, I want to look at this first little story and go all the way back to creation. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, it says this, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is one of the first presentations of the gospel, the first one in the Bible. Theologians call this verse the proto-evangelium. Proto means first, and evangelium means gospel. Genesis, the first book of the Bible, gives the story of God's creation, how God created everything. He made man, and how man fell, and that because of his fall, sickness and disease and death came in, how they were pushed out of the garden, but what God said from the very beginning in this verse 15, he's talking about a plan that he has for man. In eternity past, God had a plan for man. He knew that a Savior was going to be needed, and so he says, "Between, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. God told Satan that one day a seed of a woman was coming and it would bruise him. Jesus was born. He came into this world. He went to the cross. Satan bruised his heel. Satan thought that he had won. He thought that it was over. You see, he didn't take Jesus out. See, in Romans chapter 16, verse 20, it says this, And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. He said there's someone that's coming that's going to crush you. Someone that's going to bruise you. Someone that's going, everything you thought you had is going to be lost because of Jesus. In Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 5, it says this. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. See, even when man fell at its darkest time, God said, I've already prepared a plan. I've already prepared someone that will come and what's, what's been taken from you will be restored through a redeemer. 
to the one in the fullness of time that would come so that we could receive the adoption of sons. See, Satan tried to destroy and to pull apart and, and to take away, but God's always in a plan. But this comes from the Old Testament. This is Jesus in the Old Testament. And it's later in the Old Testament in the book of Exodus. Many of you know the story how that the uh, Joseph, his brothers came and he set him up in the best of the land. And over time, the, the Israelite, Joseph's family, the Israelites, they became so strong that the Egyptians said, hey, we better put a thumb on them or they're going to be more than us. And they put him in, in slavery and how that Moses came and told Pharaoh, let my people go. And, and Pharaoh said, no, no. And the plagues came, nine plagues, and Pharaoh still wouldn't relent. And finally, the tenth plague was to come. And the tenth plague was when the death angel would, would come through the land and destroy the firstborn of all the livestock of every human, every family. But God had a plan. It's in Exodus chapter 12, it says this, For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you, when I strike the land, the land of Egypt. Just as the Lamb of God in the Old Testament caused the death angel to pass over the houses of the Israelites to display the blood on the doorpost, on the lintel, so the blood of the Lamb of God who was slain at Calvary, when it applies to our hearts, keeps us from the judgment against us because of our sins. See, there's nothing you can do to take away the judgment of God except the blood of of Jesus. The Lord was revealing through this Old Testament story his pattern and his plan. Our salvation from death requires the sacrifice of blood of an innocent lamb. This is something we talked about in our study last week. And 1400 years later, John the Baptist introduced the Messiah to the world with these words. He said this in John 1 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But you see, we can already see back in the Old Testament that there was going to be a sacrifice. It had to be blood. And now John was saying, here comes the Lamb. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm glad I didn't bring a lamb this morning and have to sacrifice. See, back then, we've gone over this before, but I just hit it real quick. In order to do that sacrifice, it wasn't the priest that sacrificed the animal. It was the person that brought the lamb. You would bring a lamb and you would take and you would cut its throat as the one that was bringing the sacrifice. You would place your hand on that lamb, that pure, innocent lamb. And it's like the innocence of the lamb was transferred while your sin was transferred. And then the lamb had to be sacrificed and burned upon the altar. But Jesus came as the final sacrifice. But that was a picture of what happens. And because of the blood, we're free today. Because of the blood of Jesus. And in 1 Peter it says this, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, like silver or gold, from your, aim, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. See, that Passover lamb reminds us of Christ's love for us. His precious blood was shed for us so that we could be clothed with righteousness. I don't care what you do. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how many wonderful acts you do. I don't care how much money you give. I don't care. And listen, please understand me correctly on this. I don't care how much you think your Bible reading saves you or your church attendance saves you or your prayer saves you, and you need to do all of those. They don't save you. Right. Your sin is still there. Right. You can read your Bible and be a sinner. You can come to church and be a sinner. But only by the blood of Jesus, 
applied to your life does it cause the enemy to be destroyed and his power in your life to be broken it's through Jesus it's only in Jesus so all the way back to creation a plan was set in place the gospel was there and we can see in the exodus as they were leaving and passed over established because that there was going to be a lamb that came and that was Jesus but you know as they were traveling in the wilderness and they got to the, the edge of the, the Jordan they were supposed to go in and said oh there's giants in the promised land we can't go so they didn't go so for 40 years they wandered in the wilderness but in the midst of all the wilderness, God still took care of them. He fed them every day. The clothes and shoes didn't wear out. He was always there. But in the midst of all of that, they started complaining and, and whining and, and all of that. And so what happened, snakes came. Now, I don't know about you, and I always saw one person's reaction. To me, there's only one good snake. What? A dead one. Now, I've heard black snakes are great. Wonderful. And I've heard that the little garter snakes, great, good. But whenever I'm near one, they be dead. Or I'm leaving, or I'm trying to kill it. And I'm not a killer. I'm running. <laughs> Or I'm hollering for my wife. Because <laughs> she'll get it. And sometime I'll have to tell you the story that happened out in our um, house out in Craigsville. Well, I'm, out, I'm already there. <laughs> we actually had a rattlesnake out there. And I wasn't there. And I'm, not, I'm sure we had a hose somewhere, but we just couldn't get it. So my wife actually tries to run over it with the car. comes down through the yard. I, I tell you what. I'm glad she did that. I probably would have been gone. Hey, hon, there's a snake down there. You need to get that thing. <laughs> but listen, there's only one good snake. But snakes came, and people were being bitten and dying. Let's look in, in Numbers chapter 21, verse 4. Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. Now, what's happening? They're traveling. And they get discouraged. They, what, they, what happens when we get discouraged? What do we normally start doing? Whining, complaining, having a pity party. The song that keeps coming to my mind is, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. That's what we do. They said they got, they said they became very discouraged on the way and the people spoke, oh, spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. Now, you've got to understand, why were they wandering? Because they threatened to kill Joshua and Caleb and even Moses because they were afraid to go into the promised land. They're wandering because of them. And then they said, Why you, we, were, we have no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread? You know one passage of scripture calls that that worthless bread? Angels food. And they're calling it worthless bread. And every day God gave it to them. And the day before the Sabbath, they got a double load. So they didn't have to collect it on the Sabbath because there was none. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people. And many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that we take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was. If a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. So here's the picture. They're whining, they're complaining, they're discouraged, and they're fussing about Moses and about God. All of a sudden, these snakes come in. This is the only time here in that 40 years of wandering that we hear of a judgment like this, that it came in. These serpents, they came in, and people were being bitten, and they were dying. So they come to Moses, the very one they were complaining against, and said, will you pray for us? 
And so he prays, and God says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to make a serpent of bronze. And I want you to sit it on a pole. And what I have understood as the picture would be, here is a pole, and you would sit that serpent on the pole. Now I hope you get the picture here of what I'm trying to make. And it sat there, and he said, I want you to sit that in the camp, and when they look at it, they shall live. It didn't matter if you were at death's door. If you could just get your head and your eyes focused on that bronze serpent, you were live. Maybe you had just gotten bitten and said, i got to find the serpent. i got to see that bronze serpent. And you would live. It was a picture of what Jesus would be. And we can read about it in John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And what he's saying just as Moses lifted up that serpent and the people looked at it and they lived, that if we would just look to Jesus, if we would just come to him, that we would find eternal life. It's all in Jesus. But we got to look to him. But see, it comes from the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, we see Jesus. In the New Testament, it's revealed that it's all about him. Looking at him, we live. No matter what this life may bring, no matter what you may be going through, no matter what, what sin may have happened in your life that you had done, if you just look to Jesus, you live and you find life. It says, I've come to give you life, and life more abundantly. It's all in Jesus. We look for it in everything else, but it only comes through him. We need to look to him. When you get down and you get discouraged, look to Jesus. When you feel sick and you feel hurting, look to Jesus. When the problems seem overwhelming, look to Jesus. No matter what's happening, look to Jesus and you live. Look to him. He's your answer. He's everything that we need. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. And I can give you more examples as we go through the Old Testament. You can look in the Psalm 22. It's a psalm called the Suffering Servant. It's all about Jesus. You can go to Isaiah 53, and we just came out of a study where we looked at Isaiah um, 52, 13, up to 53, 12, I think it was. It's all about Jesus. But I'm going to jump to something in the New Testament that happened right after the resurrection. And I think on Easter Sunday, I may have hit this just a little bit. But Jesus had been crucified, and he's resurrected, and the word hasn't spread around to everybody. And, he's, and men were walking the road, and Jesus comes along, and they're walking the road to Emmaus, and Jesus comes upon them, and they're discouraged, and they're down, and goes, well, what's going on? They go, basically, are you the only one who hasn't heard what happened? Really? You don't know what happened? And so they explain to him, and, and Jesus starts to ex uh, open up the scriptures. Now, what scriptures would they have had again at this time? They would have had the Old Testament. They would have had the writings of Moses, the writings of Isaiah and Obadiah, and all of these in the Old Testament. They would have had those. So the scriptures are being opened to them. And as they were walking along, their eyes were still blinded. And then they get to their destination, and Jesus says, and they, they have bread, and he breaks it. And all of a sudden, their eyes were open in the breaking of the bread. And then he's gone. And listen what they say in Luke 24 and 32. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to them? These two disciples knew something was going on as Jesus opened the Old Testament scriptures. He taught them from the Old Testament scriptures concerning himself. And the result was it revived their hearts. They were filled with joy and excitement. Just knowing, just hearing the word, just having the word explained to them, opened up their heart. They said, did not our hearts burn within us? Church, if we could just get back to the time where just opening up the Bible and reading the scriptures causes our hearts to burn within us 
causes our desire for Jesus to grow, causes the depths of us to yearn for more of him. We would find things in our life starting to turn around even more. It's all about Jesus. Yes, there's some good stories that our kids learn, but it's all about Jesus, and that's what we're trying to teach them. When we dig into the Old Testament, we find Jesus. It makes the New Testament come alive, and his disciples said, Did not our hearts burn within us? We need to get back to where the, the scriptures just burn within us. It's about him. It's about him. That's what happens when you realize that he's the Jesus of the old and the Jesus of the new. We don't just skip over the Old Testament. The Old Testament comes alive as we understand it's about Jesus. Knowing Jesus from the Old Testament will restore your hope. See, see Romans 15 verse 4 says this. For whatever things were written in the Old Testament were written for our learning that we might have hope. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes when you read the Old Testament, it can seem almost hopeless. Because whenever the Israelites went into a place that they were going into the land, the promised land, they were to destroy everyone in the tribe. That can be hopeless. When you read the scripture where it says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, when it talks about some of those things and the punishments and, and the different things that happened where if you had a, a bull and it gored somebody and this happened and the stuff and all of this and this animal sacrifices, it almost seems like it's a different thing from the New Testament. But when we understand that as we dig into it and we find Jesus, it comes alive and it causes our hearts to burn. It causes our desire for him to grow because it's about him. And as we know what's there, it opens up our understanding even more. It says, for whatever things were written, were written for our learning that we might have hope. We've got hope because of Jesus. He's the Jesus of the Old Testament. He's the Jesus of the New Testament. And he's the Jesus for you today. Yes. You need him. You need him more than ever. You need to understand him more than ever. You need to grasp him more than ever. All of the mysteries of the Old Testament are unlocked in Jesus. He's the Jesus of the old and the new. Find him in the old in picture and in now in his presence. Find him in the old in the types and the shadows and in the new as he lives out his life. Most of all, find him in your heart. God has created you with a God-shaped vacuum in your heart. Until you accept him, You'll always have an empty space in your life. See, you were created to be in relationship with God. You weren't made to stay here and just live here and die. And that's it. You were made to be in relationship with Jesus. And until you have that relationship, there's going to be something in your life that's missing. You'll look for it in anything and everything. But it's only in knowing Jesus. Not just knowing who he is, but knowing him as a personal savior. As a one who died for you, that took your sins. That in exchange, he gives you the gift of righteousness. He gives you eternal life. It comes through Jesus. Would you bow your heads? Father, we want to thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for the scriptures that open up Jesus to us. Lord, sometimes when we grow in children, Lord, sometimes they're just stories. And if we're not careful, we just leave them as stories. But Lord, they're you. They're who you are. They're showing us a picture of you and your essence and your goodness and your awesomeness. Showed us what you've done for us. So you truly are in the Old Testament. You're in the New Testament. And you're for us today. Lord, we need you more than ever. We need you to keep us in your hand. We need you to take away all fear, take away all worry. We need you, Lord, to help us make sense of things that are senseless that are going on. So, Lord, we trust you. 
We ask Holy Spirit that right now that you'll speak to our hearts. You know where we're struggling. You know where we're hurting. You know what we need. Even before we ask, you know. But because of our relationship, we're called on to ask. Lord, we ask that you will work in every heart. Holy Spirit, speak to us afresh today. Speak to us anew. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You've never accepted him. You've never confessed him as Lord. He's waiting for you. He died for you. He came for you. The scripture says that we're lost without him. And it says that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. We are lost without him. We need him. I want to pray a prayer right now that comes that's simply based on Scripture. If you don't know Jesus, if you've never accepted Him, I don't care if you've gone to church your whole life. I don't care if this is your first time. I don't care if you've read the Bible through or you haven't. If you've never confessed Him and given your life to Him, you need to do that. That is That gives you eternal life through Him. He gives you eternal life because of that. We're going to pray this prayer. Pray it with me if you've never prayed it. Believe it as you pray it. Scripture says you shall be saved. If you prayed it in the past, let's pray it again with those that may be, may be praying for the first time. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross and that you rose from the dead. Based on that confession, I am saved. My sins are gone. I'm a child of God. Thank you for changing my life. Amen. Would you stand right now?